Thank you very much, Lucia, for introducing me. Um, I will indeed give a state of the art of my uh, research today, and I hope I will be able to do this, this uh, within uh, the range of one hour. <laughs> uh, I think I should be able to finish within one hour, so um, I hope you will all stay with me for that amount of time. Uh, and I'm already looking forward to uh, hear your comments and suggestions and questions afterwards. So, um, my presentation will be structured as follows. I will start with a short introduction on the general topic. Then I will broadly describe the current debate on trauma communication uh, in refugee families. And subsequently I will locate this debate in the predominant trauma discourse and question some of its central assumptions. That will then lead me to the central part of my presentation, namely a broadening of the understanding uh, of remembering trauma. And next I will present the research question I would like to explore in my empirical study. And to end, I will propose some preliminary ideas uh, for the design of this empirical study. To introduce, um, I think memory is a hot topic these days. It can be observed that uh, both public and scholarly interest in the commemoration of war and injustice uh, has increased considerably over the past few decades. And we observe that in, for example, um, the, the rise of truth and reconciliation commissions in various post-conflict countries, also the construction of experiential trauma site museums, um, the fact that many socially engaged artists tackle the issue of remembrance and representation in their work and of course also uh, the rise of the internet uh, which has enabled new technologies of memory to arise. And while many researchers have focused their attention on uh, collective memory practices in post-conflict settings, the relationship between memory and migration uh, remains largely unexplored. And in order to explore uh, the remembrance of collective violence in the context of forced migration, over the last year I have uh, conducted a literature review on this topic, exploring findings from different study domains. Uh, I started from the domain of refugee studies, which broadly speaking examines the issue of forced migration. And there are uh, different types of forced migration, but in my study I uh, choose to focus on conflict-induced forced migration, which particularly implies a history of man-made collective violence taking place in the context of, for example, armed conflict, including war or persecution on the ground of religion, race, social group, etc. And the atrocities that are inflicted upon men, women and children uh, within these contexts often cause collective trauma, damaging the social tissue of entire communities and destroying previous sources of social support. And once arrived in a uh, western host country, such as Belgium for example, this suffering often persists as refugees are usually viewed as potentially uh, dangerous others and have to face enduring contextual post-migration stress. And then, throughout the development uh, of my broader understanding of remembering trauma, which I will uh, present during the next hour, I have included insights and findings uh, from two other study domains. Um, first, uh, Holocaust studies. Um, I chose to include um, research considering the issue of remembrance um, relevant and meaningful for inclusion uh, for a few reasons. I think first, um, Holocaust survivors and forced migrants today um, face or have faced uh, similar circumstances, being for example, uh, they share a history of dislocation, uh, they have witnessed or experienced collective violence. And then a third reason is uh, that I've, I uh, found that Holocaust research on the narration and silencing of traumatic uh, memories is so incredibly uh, rich and profound that it would be plainly regrettable uh, not to include this uh, in my study. And then a third domain of study is uh, memory studies. This is a field of study which um, emerged as a truly interdisciplinary field uh, in its own right over the past decades. And 
So it involves um, insights from different disciplinary domains, but for my literature review I did not go into, for example, the more neuropsychological uh, strand of memory research, which examines, for example, the functioning and malfunctioning of human capacities of recall, uh, but I rather inquired studies um, which investigate the social and cultural dynamics of remembrance and forgetfulness in the context of uh, war and displacement. Um, first, I would like to uh, say something really short on the notion of trauma, because I think you will all know or, or, or feel that trauma has become some kind of buzzword uh, these days. Uh, everyone seems to have had traumatic experiences, and the term has been applied in so many contexts by so many people that I think it has lost uh, some of its original meaning. Um, but in any case, it can be observed that trauma has become one of the dominant modes of representing our relationship with the past. And particularly in um, approaching the experience of violence and its aftermath, it has become a key concept for scholars and practitioners uh, from various disciplines. And while the notion of trauma is thus wide and can be referring to a social political event, a psychophysiological process, a physical and emotional experience, or a narrative theme, it is uh, this dominant diagnostic construct of post-traumatic distress and its relation to war exposure, which uh, plays a central role in research assessment and uh, clinical trauma care uh, in both Western and non-Western societies today. So, throughout my presentation I will talk about trauma in different ways. Uh, I will often refer to this uh, dominant trauma paradigm, which strongly relies on uh, the diagnostic construct of post-traumatic stress disorder. And in these cases, uh, trauma, of course, uh, refers to a psychiatric illness. However, when I will talk about remembering trauma or a traumatic past in general, I refer to the consequences of experiencing, witnessing or learning about an event that involves, as I stated there, um, actual or threatened death or serious injury or other threat to one's physical integrity, all taking place in the context of organized violence and uh, the forced migration following it. And traumatic events in this context often involve torture, war, witnessing the cruel murder of significant others, sexual abuse, etc. My doctoral research is mainly uh, focused on how a traumatic past is uh, remembered within families. And existing research on this issue mainly explores processes of intrafamilial communication on trauma. The disclosure and silencing of traumatic experiences within the family context has often been studied in order to find out in what way sharing these painful memories influences the psychosocial well-being of refugee parents and their children in the host country. Both in Holocaust and in refugee studies, quite some scholars have, ex have examined processes of intrafamilial communication regarding these uh, painful war and exile related events, proceeding from the question what strategy is most supportive in coping with the impacts of forced uh, dislocation. And so far, scholars don't have a shared answer on this question. There is one quite big group of scholars who emphasizes uh, the adverse effect of silencing and argues for direct, open communication about a traumatic past between parents and children. And these scholars, they argue that explicitly narrating memory, memories and emotions is a helpful strategy to deal with the adverse consequences of trauma. In order to enhance family cohesion and psychosocial well-being of their children, parents, according to these scholars, uh, should not foster the so-called conspiracy of silence, but communicate with their children. And to give one example, uh, one study uh, with Cambodian uh, families resettled in America uh, reported that adolescents experienced real positive effects when able to address their painful history uh, with their parents. While maintaining <coughs> silence often felt easier for them and, and gave an illusion of safety, overcoming this legacy of silence within the family and community enabled students to create new meanings for what it is uh, to be Cambodian and to be a survivor 
uh, thereby contributing to their process of healing. Another group of researchers uh, stresses the influence of mediating variables on how disclosure or non-disclosure influences psychological well-being. And first, uh, I would like to refer to uh, cultural strategies. Um, by this I mean that in contrast to our Western standard of talking, there are various cultural groups that prefer to avoid talking about their traumatic past. And several studies indeed show that in cultural contexts where open disclosure is encouraged, it is likely to increase support and emotional involvement for the victim, while in those contexts where disclosure is discouraged, it may evoke contempt and hostility, uh, therefore more negative uh, effects. Um, and then some studies document that the disclosure or non-disclosure of war trauma is not in and of itself protective or pathology-inducing, but that its impact depends on the developmental stage of the child. One study showed that um, the silencing communication pattern of uh, Southeast Asian refugee parents seemed to protect young children, but invoked to the contrary uh, anxiety and feelings of depression uh, in adolescent girls. Um, other studies then suggest a more complex interaction uh, between trauma communication and the quality of family relations. Uh, with this I refer for example to the fact whether parents do or do not succeed in creating a safe home environment. And in these studies, um, several variables, among which the particular trauma history the family went through, the quality of the family relations and the type of narratives that are told within these families uh, complexly influence each other. And then finally, uh, some recent studies um, point to the divergent meanings of silence. And in these studies, silence is presented as, for example, an alternative mode of remembrance, enabling the expression of traumatic suffering and the transmission of tacit knowledge about the past. I will say more about uh, this silence later on. I will leave it uh, for now, but I will come back to this. And I think when we analyze this debate, uh, what comes to the fore is that findings and positions regarding the desirability of disclosure and silencing differ. And it disappears that up until now it is unclear um, what is most supportive in dealing with the impacts of the first dislocation for uh, refugee children and their parents. I think when we um, look at this debate, it seems that it is often conducted within um, some kind of medical discourse, as the goal is to discover the influence of various variables on the psychological well-being in order to heal uh, the wounds of post-traumatic distress. And indeed, uh, PTSD has increasingly surfaced as a common psychiatric diagnosis for children and adults who have experienced war and atrocity. To give an example, uh, according to one study, 93.8% uh, of children who were displaced during the Bosnian war were said to suffer from uh, trauma-related symptoms. And this um, often used diagnosis is uh, characterized by three major elements. First element um, is the repeated reliving of memories of the traumatic experience involving, for example, intrusive images, thoughts, uh, flashbacks, nightmares. Secondly, uh, the avoidance of reminders of the trauma, such as activities, places, thoughts or feelings uh, that call the traumatic event to mind. And thirdly, a pattern of increased arousal, uh, which may, for example, be um, being hypervigilant or uh, having a quick startle response. And I think these criteria of PTSD show that memory is a central process in the aftermath of trauma. The interaction between remembering and forgetting, or between intrusion and avoidance, um, <coughs> seem to be at the center stage of uh, the symptomatology of uh, traumatic suffering. Um, and so the, this dynamic of memory is, is crucial uh, for this diagnosis. Um, throughout the past decades, um, this 
dominant PTSD model has become subject of uh, strong criticism. And although I strongly subscribe to these uh, critiques, to discuss them all today uh, would be beyond the scope uh, of my presentation. Um, what I will do is identify two central assumptions in the predominant model of trauma care, which reveal, I think, the particular perspective uh, this dominant care model um, takes vis-à-vis -vis disclosure and silencing, uh, the two processes that are often discussed uh, within this trauma communication debate. Um, to shortly introduce you to this predominant trauma care uh, model, uh, dominant approaches to trauma care generally follow a phased approach, and I, I put the three uh, phases here. Uh, in the first phase, the focus is on uh, restoring safety, uh, meaning that um, caregivers help survivors to regain structure and control in their lives. In the second phase, the focus is on restoring remembrance, which means that survivors are uh, encouraged to give meaning to their traumatic experiences. And in the third phase, the focus is on restoring uh, connectedness, uh, which Im implies uh, supporting future perspectives and uh, an orientation towards uh, social relationships and networks. But um, in identifying uh, the two central assumptions, I will focus on the second phase uh, as a topic of my doctoral project is on, on uh, remembering. Um, first <coughs> assumption. Uh, I think it is remarkable how uh, predominant approaches to uh, trauma care locate the experience and interpretation of traumatic experience in a biopsychomedical realm. And by this I mean uh, that first, post-traumatic symptoms are localized in the brains of individuals. Uh, there are scholars exploring, for example, the change uh, in brain activity in, in persons with PTSD. Second, these events are considered to have an impact on individual psychological functioning, for example, a change in the capacity to cope. And third, uh, traumatic memories are interpreted as clinical symptoms which can be treated by means of uh, somehow technical solutions like a standardized psychotherapy. Traumatic events are thus perceived as having an impact on the self in isolation from the social, political and cultural context. It thus appears that the psychomedical model of PTSD imports post-traumatic suffering uh, into a somehow depoliticized and demoralized logic of individual emotional trauma. And as a consequence, the memories of a traumatic past are considered purely personal. Putting these memories into words when constructing a coherent trauma story is perceived as narrating a purely individual autobiography in which an inherently personal account of suffering is given. <coughs> Furthermore, trauma treatments traditionally consider uh, the disclosure of painful memories as a highly desirable, if not necessary, strategy in psychological healing. War victims are invited to verbally express themselves uh, with the aim of uh, transforming the painful experiences by reconstructing them in a meaningful, organized, uh, understandable and, and coherent narrative. And this narrative transformation is considered to allow one to organize and remember events uh, in a coherent fashion while integrating thoughts and feelings, giving individuals a sense of, uh, of control over their lives. Silencing traumatic memories, by contrast, is considered at least uh, less adaptive or even pathological. And um, while these assumptions about the remembrance of trauma are uh, dominant in uh, refugee trauma care, Reading literature from other study domains quickly made me question uh, these assumptions. Exploring insights uh, from social memory studies, examining, examining findings uh, from Holocaust research, <coughs> identifying uh, the emerging critical voices within refugee studies, and considering uh, the ambivalent findings in the trauma communication debates showed me how this predominant understanding of remembering trauma is reductive and how much a broadening of this understanding is needed. And in what follows, I will uh, challenge uh, these central assumptions 
by trying to provide an answer uh, on the following two questions. Um, so first is an understanding of trauma narratives as autobiographies justified, and second is the monolithic understanding of disclosure as reparative and silencing as pathological uh, justified. And I will try to provide an answer on these questions uh, by integrating uh, the obtained insights from those other uh, study dom domains into a broadened perspective. Um, so this is a short outline again of uh, the broader perspective I will present now. Um, I will start with the first uh, question and we'll just try to tackle uh, the assumption on trauma narratives as autobiographies. And Um, first of all, I think it is important uh, to emphasize how the so-called autobiographical trauma narratives of refugees are not only shared in uh, the private context of family and uh, trauma therapy, but function in different ways in different public contexts. For example, the media, the asylum procedure, the host society, more broadly. And in these public uh, reference domains, refugees' narratives acquire a particular social status. Individuals applying for asylum in our country uh, are usually expected to give an account of the reasons for their flight throughout the sometimes protracted asylum procedure. And in the current uh, post-9-11 uh, climate of global insecurity, Narratives of asylum applicants are generally listened to with great suspicion, with the aim of separating uh, genuine applicants from liars and fortune hunters. And for an increasing number of asylum seekers today, their fate depends on their ability to convey their experiences in a way that uh, convinces these increasingly sceptical host states uh, of their authenticity. And members of the refugee board tend to treat asylum claims narratives often as rhetorical acts of positioning, drawn up to receive a particular social status, uh, being uh, the office, official refugee status. And important criteria for admittance are uh, credibility, truthfulness, completeness and coherence of the refugee account, criteria which I think uh, ignore the fact that stories are inescapably imperfect and fluid and impacted <coughs> by the consequences of trauma. The prevailing discourse on refugees, determined by this growing culture of disbelief, clearly influences how asylum seekers' stories are received. And not only in the context of the asylum procedure, but within entire Western host societies, refugee stories are treated with suspicion or simply ignored. Asylum seekers occupy some kind of no place, we could say, outside law and custom, and also in no time, as they must wait for the determination of their resident status. And while in this condition, in a way they come to embody our fear of exile, violence and chaos, a reality most of us rather close the eyes for, by actively keeping them out, pushing them in an isolated, marginalized position in which their stories are of no matter. And when their stories are heard, they are often instrumentalized by the media or humanitarian organizations, which present a very particular image of the refugee. Sometimes this is an image of a powerless and passive victim, sometimes this is an image of a dangerous other. Often aid workers, lawyers, journalists, politicians and also researchers use refugees' testimonies as a source of information to be extracted a task to be performed, for example, uh, illustrating the goals and missions of an organization, or as a theory to be applied. Indeed, refugee stories are often approached instrumentally, implying that they are decontextualized, objectified and reduced. And this entails that a refugee sharing his or her uh, painful past does not always hold power over what subsequently happens with his or her story. And so while a refugee's account is often treated with uh, great suspicion, simply ignored or even instrumentalized for social political purposes, refugee claimants can to some extent actively uh, construct their stories depending on the particular domain of reference they find themselves in, 
Um, some authors uh, have documented this and, and uh, compared, for example, uh, the case of trauma therapy uh, uh, compared to the asylum procedure. And they say that whereas trauma therapies usually limit the focus of therapy to the remission of symptoms in the individual, and thus expect individuals to use uh, the claim of trauma, um, the acquisition of refugee identity uh, within the procedure, for example, is primarily a question of how individual asylum seekers reinvent themselves and fit their individual narratives uh, into an extended political discourse. Which, of course, makes refugees to present stories that are highly selective, hiding uh, certain parts of the story while highlighting others, for example, uh, the effect of persecution, uh, in order to obtain a particular status. So I think that in general, the what I just uh, said suggests that the stories refugees tell have a particular status in the wider uh, social political sphere, and that the form and content these stories take uh, depend on, among other things, uh, the discursive conventions that are inherent to the particular context uh, they find themselves in. Said differently, I think that uh, different public reference domains give shape to refugee stories in different ways and determining what is said and what is not said, and making these stories exceed the mere personal autobiographic level and letting them function on uh, a public level. And indeed, rather than uh, presenting refugee stories as purely personal individual accounts, recent critical studies within the domain of forced migration have started to draw attention to the interconnectedness of personal, cultural, social political, and historical meanings. Attention, which is in general, we must say, uh, still scant in the study of refugee mental health. <coughs> um, social memory studies have since long emphasized uh, the social cultural shaping of memory, arguing that the nature of what is remembered. Uh, profoundly shaped by what has been shared with others, which is moreover always memory of an intersubjective past. And uh, Bartlett and Halpwax are two pioneers in emphasizing this uh, social dimension of memory. I think maybe Halpwax might ring a bell uh, as he uh, was the one who uh, introduced the concept of collective memory. Um, Within refugee studies, the few scholars that have dealt with this intermingling of meanings have done so on, on uh, different levels. Some authors have emphasized the interweaving of personal narratives with the life stories of significant others, such as family members. And one study uh, by Beck Peterson and Montgomery, for example, um, in their study with uh, Middle Eastern families uh, in Denmark, uh, they observed that their informants did not bring personal testimonies of experiences of war, but rather interwove their own story with the history of war and persecution of their family. For example, in one uh, boy's narrative, the family history of persecution <coughs> existed as some kind of political and historical consciousness which informed uh, his current perception of the world. And the narratives his parents, his parents uh, told him about the past were in a way crucial to the way in which he narrated his experience of being a refugee. Uh, other scholars have stressed the influence of larger his historical and socio-political uh, narratives in shaping personal stories. Again, to give uh, one example, uh, Pinete, uh, for instance, he argues that the recovery of the past is really constructed around collective experiences and official historical narratives entangled with more personal and private recollections of past events. And in this way, he states uh, that retelling painful memories becomes an opportunity to represent the self uh, in a collective discourse. He specifically recounts how memory work of Cameroonian asylum seekers in South Africa is constructed around shared experiences of political involvement in their home country, which in turn reinforces uh, communal bonds. And so it seems that the concerns of these asylum seekers were not at all restricted to an inwards uh, direction, but rather they framed their memories and hopes for the future on uh, a macro-political uh, scale of social change, emphasizing their political uh, commitments, social values, and cultural respects. 
And then so other authors have emphasized the influence of uh, cultural meanings on the narration of trauma. It is the case that uh, conventional models of memory, uh, for example, the more psychological or neuropsychological models, uh, often fail to situate uh, the process of remembering and forgetting <coughs> within the specific cultural and uh, social historic context uh, of, of its production and retrieval. Yet, how the narration and silencing of memories is given shape really depends also on uh, culture-specific notions of memory. And to give one example, um, Lemelson and Suriani, they documented the case of a Balinese uh, rice farmer who uh, witnessed uh, his, all, all his uh, villagers being murdered. And he was intentionally silent with regards to this uh, traumatic event. And these authors uh, suggested that this silence can be partially explained by the Balinese cultural de-emphasis on expressing negative emotional uh, experiences and states. Uh, so, the narratives of refugees appeal to an intermingling of stories, uh, bringing personal, cultural, social, political and historical meanings together. And this intermingling of stories gets in a way shaped in the here and now, influenced by the particular context of speech. And here I find the dialogical uh, thinking of language philosopher uh, Mikhail Bakhtin helpful in understanding this here and now relational co-construction of stories. According to Bakhtin, testimony cannot be said to be only a product of the survivor, who of course speaks it, but also of the receiver with whom words, memories and stories are exchanged. This implies that this receiver, whether this is an individual person or an institution, is very influential in structuring what is said and what is said. <coughs> Therefore, narrating traumatic memories is always a joint creation, co-constructed by speaker and addressee. And in addition, the trauma narrative is influenced by the community of speakers in the past, from whom the speaker rents the words he speaks. This relational co-construction implies that refugees' narratives are no monovocal accounts of a personal experience, but rather are polyphonic, echoing different voices. And I think that this joint creation of trauma narratives implies that even in one-on-one -on -one relationships, absent voices will enter into the conversation, as a result of which a larger context can be evoked. Indeed, even in relatively private contexts, the political di dimension, such as, for example, uh, unequal power relations, may be revealed, structuring the encounter. This means we can understand personal relations in a way as some kind of microcosms. And in recent forced migration research, uh, three relevant contexts uh, in which this <coughs> microcosm is illustrated uh, can be distinguished, um, being the asylum interview, therapeutic practice and research practice. Um, and for reasons of time, I will only uh, try to well illustrate one of them, uh, the, the asylum interview. Um, as, mentioned, uh, as I mentioned uh, before, in the contemporary climate of uh, global insecurity, refugees and migrants more general are generally viewed with suspicion. And this political dimension, which validates representations of a potentially dangerous other, impacts on how the asylum interview takes shape. Unequal power relations shape the transmission of refugee stories in a way that often prevents a truly emotional encounter between judge and refugee claimant. <coughs> Some authors suggest that um, the refugee board members may sense that in their job they are in a way confirming the hegemonic position of host country members by, for example, feeling the wish to preserve their society from potential abusers and aggressors. Likewise, some refugees may feel that expressing emotions, uh, among which especially anger, could be used to confirm pre-existing negative stereotypes about them. 
So by way of conclusion, going back to the initial uh, question whether an understanding of trauma narratives as autobiographies is justified, I think uh, our analysis of, of literature points out that the stories of refugees invoke the voices of others and thus appeal to an intermingling of stories, bringing personal, cultural, social, political and historical meanings together. Depending on the particular context of speech, different aspects of the story will be invo invoked, and as a result of this intermingling of stories, an impact of various public contexts, even in one-on-one -on -one conversations, a larger context can be evoked, creating some kind of microcosm in which broader societal processes such as power disparities might enter. Hence, in contrast with the assumption of the dominant trauma perspective, which understands the trauma narrative as an individual autobiographic life story, I think it appears uh, that refugee stories are essentially polyphonic accounts uh, that are situated on the nexus between micro and macro levels of meaning. I will now uh, try to tackle um, the dominant monolithic understanding of disclosure as reparative and silencing as pathological. Um, so the first question I ask myself is whether it is correct to assume that open disclosure enables healing. The ongoing debates on trauma communication in refugee families indicates, I think, that the predominant tendency to ascribe this central role to disclosure should be approached uh, with scrutiny. And while the positive impact of disclosure is confirmed in some studies, there are likewise studies, um, both experimental studies and more ethnographic studies, that don't support this idea. It appears that for individuals who faced loss and atrocity evoked by, uh, by organized violence, conveying traumatic experiences in a narrative account does not necessarily <coughs> engender healing. Some studies then document which non-pathological roles silence can fulfill. Because it appears that silence around trauma does not necessarily equate traumatic silence, something which these dominant approaches would assume, but it seems that that is not always the case. Um, as mentioned before, silence can be a culturally influenced coping strategy, uh, for example, one study with uh, Sudanese uh, refugee women in the Netherlands indicated that these women, by keeping silent about certain traumatic memories, tried to forget, which eventually enabled them uh, to go on with their lives. In addition, silence can be a form of resistance to the dominant discourse on a particular history, Various scholars have documented the hidden strategies of resistance that may speak uh, from the expression and non-expression of particular memories. Expressing and silencing certain memories can be used to challenge dominant interpretations of the past that seek to oppress. And for example, um, Zur is an author who did a lot of ethnographic fieldwork uh, in Guatemala, and um, in her account of these Guatemalan war widows, it is stated that these women um, construct a sense of continuity and are unable to restore their dignity through the collective but hidden sharing of unofficial secret memories while remaining silent in public spaces as a way of resistance. And some authors have also documented how silencing responses to collective violence may operate protectively in dimming overwhelming experience for both the self and family members. Um, one study uh, by Rousseau and colleagues, for example, documented how uh, the silence surrounding the past in Southeast Asian refugee families uh, clearly seem to have um, a relative protective function on their children. So I think that these findings indicate that in contrast to the dominant assumption that silence is less adaptive, uh, it may really contain more than pathological avoidance. And increasingly, um, 
several scholars, uh, both in the field of uh, forced migration, Holocaust studies, and memory studies more broadly, uh, have started to argue against what is referred to uh, as an over-narrativization of memory. Various authors have observed that in the Western culture, there seems to be some kind of bias against secrecy, as open communication is considered to be favorable for psychological health and even morally superior to keeping secrets. Yet several authors have documented alternative modes of memory transmission. And it is important to acknowledge here that there is um, a slight delicate distinction between uh, silencing certain memories and remembering things in non-narrative ways. I think that while silence implies uh, keeping quiet and this deliberately <coughs> hiding uh, certain memories, non-narrative modes um, involve vehicles, which I will dis discuss now, uh, to remember certain things. Vehicles such as, for, for example, uh, the body. Um, various authors have illustrated uh, the embodied representation of traumatic memory, as is, for example, the case um, with Auschwitz tattoos. Um, it appears that nowadays uh, in Israel um, there is a practice of some descendants of Holocaust <coughs> survivors to have themselves tattooed with a replica of the Auschwitz identification number uh, of their parents or grandparents. Mm, and then also, a non, uh, another possible non-narrative uh, mode of remembering is person-object interaction, such as, for example, um, remembering lost family members by uh, giving children the, the opportunity to go, to go through old family pictures. Um, the children might not even have known the people in the picture, and there might not be an explicit conversation about uh, the cruel way in which these family members died, but still, in this way, these children participate in some kind of non-verbal remembrance, you could say. And then a last example um, are uh, ritual acts which can take place uh, within the family home. Uh, and to give one example again from uh, Holocaust research, um, Kidron is an author who studied lived memory practices uh, in Holocaust survivor memories and she demonstrated how food related practices in these families recall the tragic times of wartime starvation and the critical magnitude of daily bread rations back then. And it appeared that the practice of eating these daily pieces of bread allowed survivors to ritually reenact the moment when they ate that piece of bread commemorating the life-threatening hunger and miraculous survival, yet without explicitly talking about it in the family. So I think that these findings show how traumatic experiences can as well be remembered in a non-narrative way. And then several studies document uh, the narrative breakdown invoked by traumatic experiences. It appears that some experiences are unspeakable because they are unbearable. Violence and atrocity confronts language with its limits. Lawrence Langer, uh, a scholar who studied oral Holocaust testimonies, states that atrocity deprives culture and language of its capacity to engender narrative meaning, to construct coherent and meaningful narratives through time. He suggests that the Holocaust and subsequent large-scale atrocities exist in an orbit void of the usual consoling vocabulary. It appears that witnesses who disclose painful memories rarely feel liberated. Although their experiences can be told, they cannot truly be shared, because what they lived through was without parallel and beyond human comprehension. Instead, traumatic experiences tend to fragment memory undermine trust and inhibit expression. I think these observations argue against the assumption of predominant trauma treatments that coherent 
meaningful trauma story can be constructed, as witnessing violence and atrocity often involves an existential experience of meaninglessness. And by way of conclusion, going back to uh, the initial question, uh, I think uh, my analysis of literature points out that the remembrance of loss and atrocity should be understood beyond the dichotomous healing or pathologizing impact of telling and not telling. It appears that many studies do not support the predominant clinical consensus on the reparative function of disclosure, but rather elucidate the various non-pathological roles silence can fulfill, and besides, the various non-narrative modes of remembrance should not be ignored. Further, scholars refer to the limits of language in finding words for atrocious events beyond human comprehension. So I propose that instead of understanding disclosure and silence as two separate opposing processes, it seems that a dialectical understanding which views remembrance as the unfinalizable interplay between openness and non-expression is more fruitful. And I realize that maybe for the philosophers here, I have to uh, emphasize that I do not understand dialectical in a Hegelian <laughs> sense. Uh, but um, it is not um, a dialectical relation um, resulting in a synthesis, but rather an unfinalizable uh, relationship between these two processes. Um, and this then uh, brings me to the research question uh, I would like to explore in my empirical study. Um, moving beyond this monolithic understanding indicates a very complex interaction uh, between silence and disclosure. Several authors in research, practice and even in literature have tentatively described this dialectical tension between uh, these two processes. Disclosing traumatic experiences appears to evoke a circular relationship between narration and suffering. It seems as if memories of a painful past exceed the capacity of narration to contain uh, this traumatic experience. So, I will read uh, the quote of Professor De Haan and colleagues. Uh, Whereas narration is vital in mobilizing empathy and remembrance, it is equally painful in revisiting experience beyond meaning. This circularity of narrative and suffering entails the potential violence of narrative and implies the protective function of silence. So this struggle between the moral imperative not to forget and the extreme pain of remembering evokes a constant tension between expression and non-expression, it seems. And on this slide uh, I have put some more uh, quotes illustrating this idea of this dialectical tension. I will read them for you. Um, first, uh, Eastmont um, recounts on her own research and she says, In my own research with Chilean <coughs> refugees, I found that telling one story as political testimony of torture during the Chilean military dictatorship was a moral obligation to the members of the exiled opposition, vital in mobilizing support for their cause, but that doing so was often a return to hell for the individual. Second quote, the tension between avoidance and confrontation experienced by traumatized individuals seems to parallel a larger conflict between recounting, witnessing or giving testimony and suppressing, forgetting or even denying collective traumas and historical events. And then a third quote uh, by a Holocaust survivor. We want it to be told, but in our insight we want to forget. Deep insight in our thoughts and our hearts. It is instinctive. Try to forget, although, although we make other people remember it. And so, in my empirical study, <coughs> although this idea eh, has been uttered by various authors, it has never been empirically explored in the context of forced migration. So, in my empirical study, I would like to explore what exactly is at stake in this back and forth movement between disclosing and silencing traumatic memories for refugee families and the broader community. And I believe that this is a relevant issue uh, to explore in practice, as I hope that my findings will eventually uh, 
inform the psychosocial and educational domain of refugee care by bringing in new insights on the, the complexity of the remembrance of traumatic experiences. And I have tried to uh, narrow this question down to um, two sub-issues, you could say. Um, the first issue could be to explore how uh, this back and forth movement between silence and disclosure interacts uh, with the social context of asylum. Namely, uh, considering the context of isolation and marginalization in which many refugees live, including a context of speech in which their stories are ignored, instrumentalized or considered lies, I am curious to find out how the larger dynamics in the host society interact with this balancing movement between silence and disclosure. And the second sub-issue, whether we can understand the remembrance of trauma in its back and forth movement between silence and disclosure as a moral praxis. And with moral praxis I broadly refer to um, actions we do considering uh, moral concerns, such as, for example, um, what constitutes a good life, but also how can we coexist as human beings in a, in a just way. Um, within families who have witnessed violence and injustice, um, I hypothesize that this back and forth movement might possibly refer to a quest for doing justice to those who were lost in the war or in the conflict. Considering the limits of language in expressing unbearable pain and providing meaning, families might feel that giving words to what happened would be too difficult and in a way unjust to those who cannot testify anymore. On the other hand, they might have this moral duty to remember. In relation to host society members, this balancing movement might also refer to an ethical appeal, I think, namely to what extent are host society members who are in a way on the other side as they have not experienced the cruelties many refugees went through, to what extent are these host society members willing to listen and to share in the pain? In this moral sense, this tentative balancing between silence and disclosure might reflect a larger quest, the quest for a humane and just way to live together. And then the last slide. Um, the difficulty for me now, uh, of course, is to translate these questions into um, a good study design. And I will now quickly share some uh, preliminary ideas um, how I would proceed. Uh, considering research participants, I would like to work with a few, uh, like seven to ten uh, refugee families from one uh, cultural community. For example, uh, resettled Syrian ref refugees. This is important, I think, to limit biases to some extent. For example, a possible bias could be that refugees who have not yet acquired official residence permits would talk or not talk because they think this could influence uh, the asylum procedure. On the other hand, I feel very ambivalent about this because I don't want to inscribe myself in the current asylum logics, uh, which distinguish, distinguishes genuine from um, uh, refugees from fortune hunters. Also, I would like to include uh, host society members in order to empirically explore <coughs> this interaction of larger social dynamics in the asylum context with back and forth movement between silencing and disclosing uh, memories of a traumatic past. And I think then that the empirical study could involve three levels of inquiry. First, uh, a micro level, which could consist of uh, multi-family member qualitative research, consisting of, for example, interviews or narrative assessment, exploring reasons for talking and not talking within the family, enabling the observing of family dynamics as they happen. A second level, which I called meso level, uh, could be to organize focus groups with different members from the selected refugee community, exploring the multivocal and dialectical nature of remembering trauma in practice. And then the most uh, <coughs> level, I think, the macro uh, level, could consist of 
focus groups or interviews maybe with refugees and host society members, <coughs> exploring remembering trauma as a relational, moral quest uh, for coexistence. So this is the broad idea, but as you might uh, feel or guess, I am still struggling with how I could concretely explore uh, these issues empirically. So comments, questions, suggestions are more than welcome. I finish in 56 minutes. So <laughs> It's broad, not mm -hmm. maybe you don't have to explain that in your project. But how do you would you be would you be in favor of for, forgetting in view of a, a better living together with the society with the whole society? Uh, that's one question. That's, that's for you. I mean, I don't think you have to explain mm -hmm. that in your project. And second, uh, how are you approaching forgetting from a kind of moral point of view, or how do you approach the notion of forgetting? Mm -hmm. I mean, forgetting in view of loving your neighbor or for, uh, loving the one that has uh, uh, done something wrong with you, or Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for your questions. Um, <clears throat> I think first of all it is important to, um, I, I try to do so in my presentation, but to distinguish uh, between, for example, silencing and forgetting, because I think silencing does not necessarily mm -hmm. equate forgetting. Mm -hmm. um, but considering your question on um, whether I am approaching forgetting from a moral point of view. Um, I think in the literature um, scholars mostly talk about the duty to remember and thus to explicitly recall, um, but you also um, find studies that document, um, for example, and I think of, about a study in um, Bosnia, post-conflict Bosnia, uh, where the community decided, implicitly I think, not to bring up the war anymore in order to enable living together of different groups within that society. So in a way, as, so forgetting as some kind of strategy to be able to live together, I'm not sure whether that entails a moral aspect, maybe it does. I will uh, take your question with me for sure. Um, and then the first question, have I understood it right, that the question was, could you be in favor of forgetting in order to... Yeah, it's in relation with first, in I mean, in, I was thinking, the first, I think I should have done the first question and the second. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, if you are forgetting for something, for being good, and for being good for you and for the rest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you don't have to answer. Just <laughs> I will think about yeah. it. I can give you an answer. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> I was speaking and thinking, I'm not sure that I will be able to be, be clear because. Is it also not very important? Uh, so I think it's very interesting how you uh, criticized uh, this idea of this individual problem uh, issue. Um, but does that not mean also that you really have to take into account the different kinds of interactions in which this issue is uh, appearing or dealt with. So I mean, for example, you could say, say sorry, because you refer to the child 
parent relationship, that's one mm -hmm. relationship, but the relationship between the therapist and the, mm -hmm. is another, and the, the relation between the, uh, the inspector of the asylum as uh, as uh, is still a different context and so on. So mm -hmm. that, that are different ways of speaking. Mm -hmm. So in different contexts, so what you say in these contexts or don't say in these contexts, this is totally different. This is totally different. Mm -hmm. And so, starting from there, could you also not think about these differences that there are maybe contexts, or, or that it would be interesting to, to try to distinguish between these kinds of, of, of interactions, mm -hmm. uh, and, and to think about, yeah. Because now the categories disclosing also and silencing seem to be rather massive. Mm -hmm. That there would be different ways of also dis so disclosing. Is that simply speaking about it, or is that you, you mentioned the dematerialization, and you, you mentioned the aspect of that it can have different forms of materiality, mm -hmm. uh, the tattoos and things you mentioned, too, but also different. Can it also not be different kinds of speech, different kinds, kinds of speech. speech itself, different, mm -hmm. and and then also related to that, into to your design, into the mm -hmm. yeah, and it seems to be very crucial to me how 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 you going to to think about your own mm -hmm. talking. <laughs> So, so yeah. what, 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 what is this? And are you not immediately in the position, so if you think about the researcher, yeah, you quickly go into the position of the inspector or the, mm -hmm. maybe the crime investigator or the, the one who is trying to find out uh, something, which is maybe already a kind of, kind of yeah. Not related to another, to, another, to another possibility, maybe, or to try to think about it, is to, to which you are discussing also in another, another context, I think, is about the yeah, end, referring to, to you, because you were talking about this, about this collective experiment. Mm -hmm. uh, so, about trying to involve, involve them, themselves in the research. <laughs> So to be to not we being researching mm -hmm. them or that kind of uh, narratives, or but to find a way to involve to be involved in the research and to think oneself in the presence of <laughs> uh, the refugees and so to, to, to try to find designs in which design are together. Yeah. Yeah, which are designs yeah. that are that are related to. to Mm -hmm. to that thing. Precisely, I think, because what you've very nicely demonstrated, I think this is the need to, to get away from this, mm -hmm. this, uh, this individual, mm -hmm. this is an individual issue. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. Thank you very much for the suggestions. Um, I don't think, do I have to? Thank you. Thank you. Just thinking, because you're so nicely, develop these difficulties mm -hmm. and then the, and the mm -hmm. critiques that you can have on them. So it's not, not to think about, mm -hmm. about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Uh, I first would like to congratulate you with, uh, with an excellent uh, presentation. I really wish I had the same capacities to uh, <laughs> present everything in such a structured and, and logical and, and uh, balanced way. I think. Uh, I was a bit struck by uh, the move you made from the literature review mm -hmm. to the uh, empirical part of the research. Mm -hmm. What I missed is a kind of a historical cultural <laughs> perspective. <laughs> <laughs> that, anyway, <laughs> you're, you're well, but I have some reasons for, for asking it. A historical pro cultural, uh, uh, how do you say, um, uh, analysis of science within the Western context and within uh, the culture uh, that you are uh, going to include within within your research, so the uh, the Syrian uh, culture. Uh, what I think 
but because I think science uh, in, in the 20th century it, it went through uh, a lot of changes, uh, a lot of different things were mm -hmm. was set uh, to it. A lot of uh, examples also can be found where science uh, directly is connected to a way to remember mm -hmm. uh, something. For example, after the First World War, you had zones of science uh, in Ivers, uh, and that was a means to remember the war just by leaving everything in ruins. Mm -hmm. And so in 1921, uh, it was actually, mm -hmm. uh, I mm -hmm. think, Churchill uh, who uh, wished for such uh, a way to remember the war. Uh, and for many, many reasons that uh, didn't went through, and one uh, built it at the meaning board, which was a very powerful way of, of mm -hmm. uh, addressing the issue of rem remembrance in a completely different way. <coughs> In between then and now, I think silence, uh, the meaning of silence has transformed uh, enormously. And uh, for example, today we see a, a, a really important, I think, revalorization of silence, but in a very strange and, I think, uh, a strange way, a way that we should be suspicious of. Uh, and I think of the visit we uh, uh, <laughs> uh, No, really, which. Uh, I, I, I think there is a, there is a, a, a kind of economization of science mm -hmm. nowadays, which we should be a bit yeah. suspicious of. And I, so, so that is the reason why I think that uh, in your research, I think you also have to include the kind of genealogy of, of, of science within Western history mm -hmm. in order to sustain the argument that in the end you want to make with, uh, with regard to this back and forth between science and, and disclosure, because without that, I don't think uh, your, your results uh, can have them. Yeah, maybe they, they can have them. <laughs> uh, yeah. I think it would strengthen your audience. Mm -hmm. if you Thank you very much. Audience. I think it's a good uh, suggestion. It's an angle I did not yeah. think of yet. Um, you, you do not have to agree with that. <laughs> no, but I think it's true yeah. that it's striking how how the meaning of silence mm. indeed has changed over mm -hmm. over the years, also here in our context. Mm -hmm. Because as we, we saw in our project, there was a lot of literature on, mm -hmm. on the history of silence. Mm -hmm. uh, you have uh, Picard, uh, you have uh, uh, Le Breton, a French scholar who wrote an excellent book on, on uh, the history of silence actually in, in the West. Uh, yeah, so. mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. And, uh, I also was wondering whether uh, within memory studies a difference is made between uh, what they call, if I remember it correctly, uh, cultural memory and associative memory or communicative memory. And uh, the one has to do with uh, memories that were experienced of events that one experienced oneself. Mm -hmm. And the other one has to do with the memory of things that were experienced by by previous generations. And I was wondering whether this distinction is also something that you will uh, take into account uh, when you develop your uh, mm -hmm. empirical mm -hmm. I have to admit that now I vaguely uh, remember this mm -hmm. uh, distinction you're yeah. referring to, but I'm sure I encountered it already yeah. in uh, and not only the distinction between cultural and communicative memory, but there are many, many other yes. distinctions being made or concepts being introduced, like mm -hmm. also the concept of post-memory. I'm mm -hmm. not sure whether you heard about that, mm -hmm. which um, refers to the, uh, the memory of the second generation who did not... Uh, I think it's a bit similar maybe to this cultural memory. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm.